Hello and welcome to everyone joining us from New York City and from around the world for today's webinar. Uh, I am Kian Tajbaksh, I'm the and as the coordinator of the Committee on Forced Migration at Columbia University's Global Centers, which has organized this event, I am pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists who will address the critical areas of education and public health affecting the well-being of displaced populations. I would like to thank our colleagues, Professor Mary Mendenhall and Dr. Vidur Chopra of Teachers College for putting the panel together. I am also very pleased to welcome today's distinguished guests, Dr. Yoshikawa of New York University, Dr. Martini from the International Organization for Migration, and our colleagues from Teachers College, Dr. Lena Verdelli and Dr. Mary Mendenhall. I'd like to say a few words about the Committee on Forced Migration. Um, it is an initiative of the Columbia Global Centers, which is led by Professor Safwan Masri, the Executive Vice President for Global Centers and Global Development. Columbia Global Centers works within countries that host a large number of refugees around the world, including cities such as Amman, Istanbul, Nairobi, and Tunis. In response to the crisis posed by the pandemic and the impact it had on populations facing forced migration, the Global Centers established the Committee on Forced Migration in 2018 to address this series of problems. The Committee on Forced Migration brings together 50 or more faculty from across Columbia schools and affiliates who work on forced migration and includes those who desire to create a multidisciplinary academic and practical set of solutions to the crisis. This initiative, the Committee on Forced Migration, is one of a number of forced migration related activities that global, the Global Center supports, including Columbia University's Scholarship for Displaced Students, the Amman Mellon Foundation Global Center's Fellowship Program for Emerging Displaced Scholars, the New University in Exile Consortium, and a number of regionally focused forced migration related programming hosted by our individual global centers around the world. The aim of the Committee on Forced Migration is to maximize Columbia's ability to provide an institution-wide platform to engage, support, and share information across Columbia's community of faculty, students, and staff. We also hope to act as a convener to bring the world's thought leaders in global migration together. Today is the second event of a year-long online series entitled Forced Migration in a Post-Pandemic World. The series looks at the impact of this crisis on forced migration, both current and long-term, um, through to the post-pandemic, we hope, era. The Committee on Forced Migration event series centers on four multidisciplinary themes. Preparation and planning, where we bring voices from the front lines, um, the pandemic's impact on policies, laws, and public opinion. Third, the pandemic's impact on mobility, migration routes, and demographics. And finally, prospects about envisioning the future. Future events will feature eminent Columbia and external experts and voices from the front lines. Events will be held every two weeks and I'm pleased to announce that the next event will be Thursday, October 22nd at 10 a.m. entitled Climate, Conflict and Coronavirus, a perfect storm for migrants and displaced persons. So finally, I'd like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us for this event, and I hope you, you will join us for future events. I'm now pleased to hand, turn it over to Vidur, who will moderate today's program and introduce our speakers more fully. Thank you, Vidur. Hello. Thank you, Kian. Hello, and welcome to all of you joining us from across the world. Uh, I am Vidur Chopra, a postdoctoral research fellow in forced migration and education at Columbia University's Teacher College. As your moderator, I am delighted to welcome you today for this conversation organized by Columbia University's Committee on Forced Migration 
Today's conversation will focus on issues of education, health, and well-being for displaced populations, strengthening coordination and approaches across humanitarian sectors. And so it's a, it's a large, big question that we're trying to get at as we think about intersectoral collaboration in humanitarian settings. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has called the coronavirus pandemic the greatest test the world has faced since World War II. COVID-19 has and will continue to have debilitating impacts on children across all ages. As per UNICEF, up to 1.6 billion children and young people have been affected by school closures, many with no internet access at home. 36 million children could go hungry in 2020 itself and nearly 80 million children under the age of one in at least 68 countries may miss out on receiving life-saving vaccines. Moreover, families and communities are under great duress as they confront a loss of livelihoods, disruptions in food supply chains, and increasing economic insecurity. These proximal and distal factors have long-lasting implications on the realization of children's rights globally and the enabling environments that allow children to, to develop and thrive. For humanitarian settings, many of these impacts are further compounded by the presence of forced migration as induced by conflict, interpersonal violence, climate change, and now economic decline. And all of this is against a backdrop of rising xenophobia, nationalism, and isolationism in our current global order. In fact, in settings of forced displacement, many would frame COVID-19 as a crisis within a crisis. Yet at the same time, COVID-19 also represents new opportunities. What can countries in the global north learn from emergency and humanitarian settings that have long-standing experiences of addressing and managing crises? With humanitarian organizations recalling their staff from country office level operations, we're also seeing instances of communities and local organizations come together in ways never done before to engage in what we may call as an everyday humanitarianism. And so we see that the effects of COVID-19 on humanitarian settings, and particularly on children, are yet to be seen. But at a moment in time where everyone seems to be operating in crisis mode, we hope that this conversation can be a moment to step back and take a hard look at where we are coming from, where we are right now, and where we seek to be as a collective humanity. Joining me today in this important moment of deliberation, discussion, and lively and respectful debate, are our panelists who will be examining many of these issues while keeping children, communities, and families at the center of this discussion. Before I go ahead and introduce them, I just want to offer some norms that will guide our discussion today. One, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a question and answer box that is for questions, comments, and thoughts as you listen to our, our panelists and engage with their ideas. Two, there will be time for audience Q&A at the end, and so please continue to use the Q&A box to direct your questions to specific panelists or uh, to the panel as a whole. Three, our goal is really to keep this conversational, to learn from one another. And towards that end, I also encourage panelists to ask each other questions. Today, we are joined by Dr. Mary Mendenhall, Associate Professor of Education at Teachers College, Dr. Hiro Yoshikawa, the Courtney Sale Ross Professor of Globalization and Education at New York University, Dr. Lena Verdelli, Associate Professor of Clinical Psychology, also at Teachers College, and last but not the least, Dr. Michaela Martini, Migration Health Regional Specialist for East and Horn of Africa at the International Organization for Migration. A very warm welcome to all of you, and thank you for doing this today. So I asked each panelist to offer some introductory remarks that can speak both to the challenges and new opportunities that their sectors confront as a result of COVID. Panelists will offer introductory remarks for five minutes, after which I may ask them a clarifying question or ask them to share their reflections on the preceding panelists' comments. So let's go ahead and get started and let's begin with Dr. Hiro Yoshikawa. If you could just say the sector that you represent and then go ahead and uh, share your introductory remarks. Thank you. Sure, um, I work in the area of early childhood development. Um, and so that uh, typically covers the um, prenatal period up to the early years of um, primary school. Um, so let's say age eight or something like that. Um, so um, I think my remarks will be kind of very specific to the developmental context. Um, uh, this is certainly a huge 
actual developmental period, even though it's short because of the um, uh, very many changes that go on in human development and the critical role of um, parents and caregivers and adults in children's lives um, during this stage. Uh, so, so we can think about, for example, the prenatal context and the threats that the virus has created to preventive services um, in the antenatal period. Um, you already mentioned vaccinations, and these are critically uh, important, and yet some of the first services to go um, uh, as the virus has reduced um, services, but also reduced mobility to get to the kinds of so uh, sources of care, um, reduce the work of community health workers. Um, and so these are huge uh, immediate risks. Um, I think we'll probably have quite a lot of conversation about violence. There is um, data showing that both mental health problems uh, among adults um, and uh, domestic violence, which we know has critically um, powerful uh, effects in early childhood, um, have increased um, from a variety of country uh, uh, studies. Um, and these have been uh, uh, summarized by UNICEF and others. Um, the learning losses of um, uh, shutdowns, uh, certainly in early education, pre-primary education, but also earlier kinds of uh, care and learning programs. Um, these uh, have meant that uh, parents and caregivers and adults in the household are ever more primary in their um, already powerful influences on early childhood development. And so the critical stresses um, from food insecurity, from job loss, from uh, 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 poverty, and then from forced migration, uh, not the least of which are uh, the kinds of influences um, that are affecting children and therefore are making extra challenges for how to support parents. Um, I would say the challenge and the opportunity are the same, which is actually quite familiar to the early childhood development sector, except that this is now further intensified, which is the need for multi-sectoral coordination and services. Um, in our sector, we often talk about the coordination of services because it's literally often impossible to provide health, nutrition, child protection, and social protection services through one delivery platform. Um, and so it's often about coordination across these services. Here we have a further intensified uh, uh, situation where often the only modality might be something like a phone-based intervention, um, or it might be through radio or TV. And how do we provide those multiple sectors of support? How do we provide the COVID messages, the well-being messages, um, uh, attention to nutrition, and then also to early learning and thriving and, and, and responsive and nurturing care. That is the biggest challenge. And, but I think uh, there are examples in a whole variety of contexts uh, where these have been integrated. Um, and I would say that phone-based services are, are one place where within a single phone call and very many kind of curricula uh, that have been developed um, in uh, situations of forced migration, we're seeing the integration of all of these kinds of messages uh, within even half an hour. We're seeing even conversations with children um, uh, in these uh, uh, as the kinds of community health workers, the ECD workforce have pivoted in many cases to, uh, to phone-based. And we've seen also innovations in television and radio um, support. Um, I don't know where I am in terms of time. Is that about it? Yeah, you, I think that's good. Maybe if you could just clarify a little bit about what does this phone-based intervention look like and what happens in the duration of those 30 minutes and how is there some sort of prioritization of because of, of different sets of services since it's a multi-sectoral approach here? Sure. Um, I can give a little bit of a kind of um, average <laughs> set of, from the curricula I know of, which are in places like India, Bangladesh, um, and the Middle East. Um, and so these are often starting with a basic needs check-in um, that we ha do have to start with the basics of food, shelter, um, uh, and health, and certainly COVID uh, messages, right? Um, then I think uh, many of the uh, of these kind of comprehensive curricula include um, addressing coping strategies and attention to well-being and mental health. Um, and so 
uh, that's really critical. And uh, tellingly, um, last in the order actually, are things like parent-child activities or adult-child activities. Many of these are going to fathers, they're going to other family members. Uh, there are certainly family configurations where you know uh, uh, we have um, uh, uh, a variety of family members. So the traditional emphasis on of the ECD sector on the mother is increasingly kind of not really <laughs> addressing the full picture of household supports. So, um, so but these kind of parent-child learning activities, um, the important key there is to try to tailor to the developmental and learning level of the child. And that of course is really um, challenging. And we know this from primary education and teaching at the right level. Um, it's just as critical, if not more so, during early childhood when development occurs so rapidly. Great. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go to Dr. Lena Verdelli next. Thank you. Uh, so my sector is mental health. And uh, COVID uh, had enormous and I have to say quite unforeseen effects. On the mental health of the population around the world, especially the most vulnerable people, uh, who include uh, refugees, uh, but also the mental health systems around the world. There are four reasons for this. Um, first of all, the speed and extent of the impact uh, and unavailable inoculation uh, and treatment uh, result in very high levels of distress um, in, we get now um, in JAMA, um, very prestigious medical journal, um, um, showed surveys um, uh, where there are three fold increase in distress in a number of, uh, in the US, and this has been replicated in other countries um, around, well, the risk and the impact of infection, uh, but also the measures for prevention of infection, like on uh, closures distancing, isolation, and the immediate and long-term impact of infection on economy, education, and livelihood. This is taking a tremendous toll on people. The other thing that happened is a um, big challenge for my sector uh, is that within weeks, uh, the mental health uh, uh, world had to transfer tools and whole service networks from in-person to online or mobile uh, platforms. Um, and for the first time, I think during a disaster, the mental health has been identified explicitly as a priority. UNHCR, you know, um, with partners um, published recently a study showing that there was, uh, the, there was increased need and demand uh, by 50% uh, in, uh, in Jordan, uh, in refugee camps, uh, in, in Zadari uh, and um, um, uh, other uh, urban refugees in Jordan. So there is, so at the time of increased need, increased demand, there is decreased availability and that's the fourth point here. Um, the mental health services have been enormously disrupted because of, well, funding cuts, uh, social distancing, illness uh, for many of the providers. Uh, a recent survey by the World Health Organization showed in 93% of the countries, uh, they reported major disruption in mental health services. So, so these effects of the pandemic uh, for the displaced population are compounded by the effects of uh, ongoing humanitarian emergencies. And many of them, in addition to COVID, and in addition to chronic you know, problems with food security, uh, other types of uh, security, lack of uh, resources in uh, refugee camps, for example, there are other emergencies uh, that force them and work in quite opposite direction. Uh, than COVID. For example, in uh, Cox's Bazaar, there was uh, flooding in this camp of uh, 900,000 uh, Rohingya refugees. Um, so the measures that they had to take to deal with that, uh, of course, uh, precluded um, social distancing that needed COVID. Same thing after the blast in Beirut. And 
the background is the sociopolitical and economic fragility in countries that host vulnerable populations because like 80% of um, the population of refugee population is hosted in low resource settings. So um, there was some also unprecedented calls for action for the first time explicitly, you know, the uh, Secretary General had a human right call for action to address increased emotional suffering. And that was echoed by UNHCR, by uh, Grandi's explicit urge for prioritization of mental health support during COVID. Now, um, you asked about some opportunities. Well, so um, as we see uh, COVID as in some ways, uh, very sad ways, a dress rehearsal for other types of, you know, disasters um, um, that may have to do with climate change, other epidemics, uh, increases in forcible displacement, violence, state fragility. So it forces us to think how to make uh, the, the systems, the mental health care systems more versatile um, and, and more community-based um, where community gatekeepers uh, like leaders, uh, lay health workers, you know, can play a central role. Um, there is more discussion in families, communities uh, about uh, mental health, which is I think a very important thing. And a very uh, important element to keep in mind, there is a big opportunity on a policy level. And, and one great example um, in my experience has been the Lebanon um, example. So uh, in uh, 2015, the Ministry of Public Health initiated a mental health strategy um, uh, uh, as a response to uh, the Syrian uh, crisis, to the um, uh, effects of Syrian crisis in Lebanon and the uh, displacement. Um, they, uh, they adopted a human rights approach that everybody who lives in Lebanon uh, had to have access to excellent mental health care, evidence-based and, and, and uh, emphasized in that call, uh, emphasized uh, uh, mental health care for uh, vulnerable populations. So uh, the funding for uh, the uh, mental health needs for displaced population were used uh, for, in a way that the host population also benefited. Um, and uh, because the, as a result of this more uh, centralized, you know, strategy, uh, the ministry had the chance during COVID to have also a national response with uh, online, you know, um, uh, tools, um, hotlines, um, coordination with NGOs uh, and various ministries, academic centers. And that benefited also, in addition to COVID, uh, the response to the blast later on. Um, so uh, there are, uh, you know, uh, it's a tremendous uh, need, uh, tremendous demand, uh, but also a tremendous opportunity for us to uh, change our systems of health to, um, for you know times of vulnerability for the most vulnerable population and later on i'll discuss also the um, some um, coordination among sectors like for example the mental health and, and protection sector given the impact on uh you know increased um domestic violence right um and and uh, child abuse um, in COVID. But I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Dr. Mendenhall. Great. Thanks, Fedor. And hello, everyone. Um, I guess, yeah, when I think about the education sector and specifically the field of education and emergencies and education and forced displacement contexts, uh, the list of challenges is pretty long, um, but I'll highlight three for to kind of kick off this conversation. And there's certainly some echoes with what I heard Hiro and, and Lena talking about as well. 
Um, first, I think an overarching challenge is that we're trying to respond to the new realities caused by the current health pandemic on the one hand, while trying to deal with the crises that pre-existed um, pre-COVID, or sorry, pre-existed um, prior to the pandemic on the other hand, and I think Lena was picking up on that point as well. So there are multiple things happening at once and people are having to adjust and accommodate uh, the new realities and the new demands of this work. And so enforced displacement settings, um, many of which are protracted, right? So people have already been displaced for five years and more. Uh, they might have already been experiencing uh, resource shortages uh, in terms of funding, uh, in terms of education personnel, in terms of food supplies. And so now those uh, shortages are further exacerbated amidst the pandemic. So it's just everything's become even more complex than it already was um, before. Uh, second and somewhat related to my first point, I think is a real concern, and I heard Hiro talking about this, but how much ground we're going to lose uh, as a sector. Uh, the gains made to get kids into school and learning is already a really huge undertaking amongst refugee and displaced populations. And those gains are now in jeopardy, uh, especially for girls in many contexts. Um, so pre-pandemic, for example, we had seen some pretty steady progress um, when you think of uh, refugee access at the primary school level. We were reaching you know, 77% and had seen those increases over the years um, compared to non-refugee populations globally, which is around 91%. And unfortunately, we expect uh, this progress to take a major hit. Uh, and educational access for refugees at the secondary level and tertiary level were already incredibly low pre-pandemic. And so the longer uh, the health pandemic uh, affects families and caregivers' um, economic prospects, uh, the more kids will stay out of school and have to work to support their families. And third, and I think you know, these are all kind of connected in some ways, right? There'll be, there will be major setbacks for girls' education, not only in getting them back into school, um, but also because of the anticipated increases in early marriage, early pregnancy, and the sexual and gender-based violence that tend to accompany these types of crises. And so we know, for example, from uh, the Sierra Leone Ebola crisis, there was a 65% increase in teenage pregnancy in some areas. Um, and I heard Hiro uh, pointing to, to some of those um, challenges as well. And then the uh, UN Girls Education Initiative, for example, they estimate that an additional 10 million secondary school age girls may be out of school post pandemic. And so we know schools aren't always safe, right? We, we, we struggle with that in, in any environment and, and especially in education emergencies environments. Um, but in most cases, they provide a protective environment for girls and young women. Uh, that now has been lost in many places, including right here in the United States, mind you. <laughs> um, and then just two points maybe around new opportunities. Uh, if I think about strengthening research, uh, I see how many of us, probably everybody on this call, are having to pivot, right, to adapt our research work to account for the impact of the health pandemic. And so as we layer in this new reality and, and adjust our research frameworks to account for the implications and the impact of COVID-19, you know, certainly that's going to help further strengthen the evidence base, so to speak, both in terms of how we're responding now and hopefully how that evidence can feed into future preparedness efforts. Um, but I also think the fact that we're not able to travel to many of our research sites also forces us to develop more collaborative relationships with local researchers if we're not already taking those approaches. And so hopefully um, we'll see more localized approaches to conducting research uh, and to having kind of more balanced relationships between local researchers and international researchers. Uh, and lastly, uh, we just celebrated World Teachers Day on Monday, and I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the critical role that teachers play in all of this. And so I think an opportunity that presents itself is that the pandemic has reminded everyone, uh, literally the world over, how critical teachers are, how hard that job is that not everyone can do it, despite parents and caregivers' best attempts to fill the gap and, and draw in familial and community-based approaches. 
and that teachers need more support. They are working tirelessly to provide not only the academic content, but also social emotional learning support to their students. Um, teachers have always worn multiple hats and now additional demands are being placed on them because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And so the opportunity we have is that there's this, you know, kind of renewed and new founded uh, respect and recognition for teachers. And we have to figure out how to leverage it um, to actually continue supporting teachers post pandemic, um, not only now, but also post pandemic in real meaningful and sustainable ways um, that, you know, isn't just more training, but actual, um, you know, stipends and payments and compensation that reflect the work that they're doing, uh, ongoing continuous professional development to acknowledge the, the, the multiple hats that they wear and just broader kind of systemic and policy level change. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there for now. Thanks. Thank you, Mary. Um, and thanks for reminding us of the importance of the critical role of, of teachers in, in all of this. Uh, last but not the least, let's uh, go to Dr. Michaela. Hello. Hello, thank you so much. Uh... Good evening or good morning. It depends on which part of the world you are seated. Uh, I am in Nairobi and my angles today is on the health component and impact of the COVID, focusing on displacement. And uh, I work for the International Organization for Migration. So we, as we see uh, on the field and the feet on the ground, which was uh, the, really the impact of revising all our operation in terms of preparedness or response as soon as COVID started. I want to highlight some points, but I want to start on the fact that uh, we know that majority of displaced, uh, actually we reach now 84% of displaced person are host in the low and middle income countries. And then we know with already highly fragile health systems and uh, competing priority also in terms of health. But we know also that the large number of these places now, they are living outside the camp and majority they are living in urban city, creating uh, another reality where these places, they are living together and sharing health services of host population. So the first challenge and that practically we faced, how to enhance and integrate the approach of displacement and the hosting population. We have seen, in, especially in the region where I am based, the uh, east and uh, north of Africa, we host uh, 3.5 million of displaced persons. And uh, looking at only the South Sudanese crisis uh, with 2.2 million of South Sudanese are hosted by neighboring countries, Uganda, Ethiopia, and Kenya. So the displacement uh, component uh, is uh, heavily present uh, in this part uh, and in Africa. So when COVID arrived, the, the first uh, challenge for public health was how we could introduce preparedness response plan, a risk mitigation measure in an area and setting where uh, is, uh, is already uh, critical to provide safe water, sanitation, and the condition as we know, overcrowding, living condition, etc. That was one of the biggest challenges to revise and adapt the global guidance, also issued from WHO, in a setting on the field level. Honestly, I think humanitarian actor, I would say they have done a, 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 an excellent work because it looks like so far that the number of COVID cases has been contained in those uh, settings comparing to the general population. So this is chapeau to all the humanitarian actors, especially in this region. But my first point, and I'm glad uh, uh, Dr. Hiro has already mentioned, was that one of the biggest challenge was continuity of the health services. And this is true. I have seen also from some health services that we are managing uh, a quite substantial decrease in access, especially for antenatal care and vaccination. And both in South Sudan, we have seen it, but also in urban area like in Nairobi, where we are running a primary health clinic. So one of the challenges for the next phase, it can be how to prevent this, uh, uh, this gap in providing continuity of health services. 
And from one side was also competing on donor attention or COVID, so maybe decreasing attention or routinely humanitarian and emergency uh, approach. So that's my first uh, message on continuity of health services. My second point is something maybe more African driven, and it's the issue that as we know uh, COVID is a, is a global health security uh, component and uh, has passed through the borders. We have been focusing on uh, majority designated point of entry like airport and port, etc. Something that I think we have undermined. And in reality, like in Africa, where uh, borders are extremely porous, population is used to pass through an official entry point. And this is what we have seen during COVID with the lockdown, the closure of the designated point of entry. Uh, we have registered as IOM an increasing number uh, passing through unofficial entry point, which totally lack of health surveillance. As a matter of fact, that this morning I was in a meeting with the regional uh, team of WHO, they were confirming that there is an increase of COVID epidemic across the border. So my second message is how we can enhance or reinforce the core capacity of the international health regulation, which is the guiding document for cross-border health, introducing a concept that it may revise the, the point of entry, looking at more the mobility continuum. And this is an advocacy dialogue that as IOM, we have always started. And uh, with COVID, I think we have seen the reality, how we can better monitor for health surveillance is at the border. My third point uh, is on access to services for those fragile population and displaced. We have seen that they have been left and neglected by the preparedness response. Majority of the country, they were focusing more on population and they were already struggling to cover assistance for testing, quarantine, case management, etc. So what uh, I can share that we have seen two different response. One was the national response from government, and then the other from the humanitarian sector, dealing uh, and accessing displacement, helping government, because it was not going to be possible for the government to manage both both elements. So as a humanitarian actor for public health, we were split also in these two, two elements. And uh, I want to link as a message this lack of access to services, the fact that African countries, they are going toward the universal health coverage dialogue and process. And currently, with some exception, but migrants and uh, are left out in this stage of the conversation. So my strong message today is also to ask to progressively start including also migrants in the dialogue of universal health coverage. And of course, we need the support of financial institution that can work with the, with the country level to assure health coverage from financial mechanisms as well. My last point is on uh, data and statistics. This was one, uh, one of the main challenges. It was extremely difficult to collect the reliable data and tracking the epidemic among displaced uh, and, and migrants as well. But mainly also because the current health information management in many countries, they are not uh, systematically co uh, collect uh, uh, health indicators for migration status. So I will leave also this message as a possible uh, uh, in future engagement uh, to start incorporating migration variable in the health systems in order that even if when there is an outbreak, the epidemic, it would be easier to forecast uh, and uh, to monitor and track as well as integration of uh, displacement and migrant into preparedness and response plan. I think I've finished now for now here. Thank you. 
Wonderful. Uh, thank you so much. So as I hear all of you speak, you know, there is this um, resonance and this theme of sort of coordination and, and integration that is coming right at multiple levels. So we think of coordination and integration across different sectors that you represent. Uh, but we're also thinking of uh, greater coordination and integration as we think about communities that are impacted by displacement as well as host populations. Uh, and then, you know, um, Michaela, as you were referencing, thinking of this sort of this cross border uh, nexus and thinking about how what happens in in neighboring countries and neighboring communities impacts us and so we it really sort of shows us the interconnected nature of uh, of of COVID and its impacts. Um, I just want to ask this this question of there's there's this question of systems right and thinking about what happens at a systems level, but we're also seeing lots of um, community led action. And sometimes those can be in tension with one another and how can we take what is happening at a community level and think about integrating it into a systems level? Uh, and what does that mean for, for the sectors that you represent? Uh, so maybe if I, I could start with uh, Lena, since you spoke about the idea of community-based volunteers getting engaged in, in the provision of mental health and speak more to that. Um, yes, thank you. Um, uh, you know, recently, um, a randomized controlled trial came out um, uh, where there was a public-private partnership uh, with academic centers and, and um, uh, ministries, um, and, and they, they uh, worked with refugees uh, who themselves actually designed this um, um, psychosocial intervention um, to reduce, you know, stress, even PTSD, uh, certainly stigma for services. Uh, and, and they used narratives. This was tested in Zadari uh, camp uh, with very good results. Uh, so involvement, direct involvement of refugees that many of my colleagues here um, you know, uh, mentioned is very important. The other important point in my uh, field, there is no way we can tackle the tremendous need for mental health services around the world and bridge the gap between those who need services and those uh, who get services um, without the assistance of community health workers. Um, uh, we now depend a lot on community health workers uh, in, uh, you know, our work with, you know, in, in Bangladesh with our Hinga refugees, uh, in Tanzania with uh, refugees from Burundi and Congo and DRC, um, uh, who bridge the gap. These are non-specialists, these are non-mental health providers, but they, they bridge the gap between the um, displaced people, the community, and the primary care center, or even the mental health specialists. So um, many times, you know, religious leaders and uh, other opinion leaders are involved uh, in uh, shaping, you know, um, and, and, and assist, you know, in the minimization of stigma. So these are some of the examples that I had in mind. Okay, thank you. Um, would any of you want to respond, Hero or Mary, to that? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so I can say a little bit with some examples from Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, um, where I think both at the systems level and then in terms of community leadership and engagement, there have been some real nice innovations. And I actually see um, the co-chair of the ECD working group um, there in Cox and Star, which is the, uh, uh, the multi-sectoral group uh, meeting around ECD uh, needs. Um, and so uh, one of the NGOs that's part of their work group um, has uh, done a lot in terms of engaging youth to make sure that the COVID messages um, that are uh, being disseminated are actually being perceived accurately, um, because I think this is a, a particular challenge uh, among the Rohingya refugees there in Cox's Bazaar because of the language complexities um, uh, 
which I can go into, but I, you know, that's partly a level of detail. We did. That's like beyond the scope of this particular uh, uh, webinar. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so I think that's, that's really an instance of Rohingya youth themselves um, and leaders uh, and NGOs that organize and work with youth in those communities to um, address really a critical health um, uh, disconnect that can happen when the messages are coming. Uh, perhaps without enough understanding of the Rohingya language. Um, another are the para-counselors, um, very much along what Lena said, um, para-counselors that BRAC um, has uh, trained up and they are community members and they are um, uh, essentially a additional workforce. So they don't, uh, they aren't taking the place of, for example, um, teachers or uh, kind of uh, home-based informal care providers, but they provide a lot of critical um, psychosocial support um, uh, to all of their uh, programming there in, in Cox's uh, Bazaar. So, so an example of a, a multi-sectoral group that's bringing together the ECD uh, actors and uh, NGOs and innovations within the context of Cox's Bazaar. Harry, do you see parallels with, um, you know, the the expectations that are placed on sort of on on communities and and on community health workers or sort of para counselors as hero was referencing with sort of the expectations that are placed on teachers where there's just more and more being piled up um right at this particular moment and how do we think of that from a systems level and what what does that mean moving forward yeah no it's a great question and i think it's one we've struggled with you know again pre-pandemic and and now has been further illuminated in this process and so a lot of the work I'm doing right now is in Uganda and South Sudan, and, and we're hearing, um, even though we can't visit the field, we're in touch with our partners and, and teachers on the ground, and we're hearing about how they're, you know, working with the education authorities to organize the home learning packs. They're helping with the physical distribution of those packs. They are checking in, um, you know, around basic needs and uh, psychosocial support needs with their children and families and caregivers. Um, so they're both, you know, continuing to be educators in this space. They're providing some type of counseling support, whether they're prepared to do that or trained to do that or not. Um, and so again, yeah, they're wearing those multiple hats and um, navigating this, this new reality and, and trying to be present uh, and, and accountable to their students and the communities. A lot of teachers who aren't involved in some of those activities are desperate to get back to work um, and provide those services. So I think, you know, the connection you were talking about between community-led action and, and systems, again, I think we have this opportunity to draw more attention to what's happening at the community level. Um, I think there's a real risk that this is going to be a passing, fleeting moment, and we don't find ways to harness that and, again, kind of build them into the system. And I don't think those processes are mutually exclusive. I think when we're talking about education emergencies or support for learners, or a lot of my work increasingly is around support to teachers, it's really about both, right? It's about making sure, as everyone on this call is talking about, uh, including these, these the, the, again, I'm, I'm talking from the education sector, so including learners, including teachers in decision-making processes, right? Better highlighting their day-to-day, -day, what their needs are, creating meaningful ways for them to participate in the decision-making process. But so, and it's taking that and kind of feeding it upstream, but then still mobilizing at that donor level, at that national government level about what the challenges are. And I think you have to kind of do both of those things in concert um, to really make uh, some movement in the field. Um, so I hope all of us can think about, you know, this uh, in some ways um, expedited localization process that we see happening because of the COVID-19. We've been talking about it as a goal for humanitarian response for years and years and years. Now it's kind of thrust upon us. And so there's a real opportunity to leverage that. Um, but again, how can we do that in a way that remains sustainable and meaningful and doesn't kind of, the pendulum doesn't swing back the other direction as soon as we're, you know, have a vaccine and kind of back to work, so to speak. So I think there's still some, you know, big questions to answer there. Thank you. Uh, so just along those lines, Michaela, this, this, the question is for you, right? Um, if we were to think of a post-pandemic point, you know, whenever that might be, in the future, and I know that can be a little bit hard to do to think about right now. Um, what do you hope does or does not happen in your sector when we get to this pandemic, post-pandemic point? 
Well, that's, uh, that's, I think, the, the most challenging question because, I mean, as you can see, uh, COVID has uh, shown how unprepared we were. Even in countries that we were supposed to have preparedness plan, a response plan with a higher health systems, we have seen the fragility. And something that I think we should reflect, what COVID had taught us, the link of the public health with the socioeconomic impact. And this is to me is bringing back to what 10 and maybe more years ago we were discussing on the social determinant of health. And just 10 years ago, migration, for instance, was included in the, as a social determinant of health. I think we have failed to approach migration as social determinant of health and not treat it equal to other social determinant of health. As a matter of fact, the migration movement of people is still left in isolation from the public health in terms of tools, in terms of approach, even talking practical things in a, at the health facility. For instance, here yeah, in uh, at cross border, if you're a doctor, a doctor, you need to know if the person is going to move because it's important for continuity of care, for harmonization of protocol, and also for that analysis. But this, uh, this element is not captured in the current health systems. So it's a gap that COVID had really clear show, show us that we need to improve. So if you ask me what, what I want to see, amongst many things, of course, in the immediate, how can we track the movement of people for public health purposes, and how we can assure that the public health value is, is for all, because it is the basic human rights principle is really put into practice. Of course, when we are dealing with migration, the area that we need to enhance is the health diplomacy. How with public health argument, we can influence the migration policy. Because at the end, when we are facing uh, uh, migration and health, which is the, the migration component of the health, uh, is mainly dominated by migration policy. And this is means uh, if, you, if you lose your job, uh, like the case of COVID, the majority of migrants, uh, you become stranded in, uh, in the countries with no possibility to return, you don't have access to health service because of your irregular stay in the countries. So there are things in terms of human rights that we need to rephrase. There is uh, the dialogue, as I mentioned before, of universal health coverage to really reinforce and the social determinant of health. I hope that the experience of COVID really give us the message that we seriously need to work together with the economic and social uh, uh, component. I'm just adding something on the mental health and psychosocial. I'm glad that, that we introduced it, and I do agree with Dr. Helen that it's the first time that we see very well recognized. We, we had experience and new angles as IOM and also the partner, because we are leading the point of entry coordination as IOM. And uh, the point of entry, especially border officials, they has been exposed to a tremendous stress because they have to deal with the cargo, which were the only one authorized to pass. Cargo, they, they were required to have mandatory testing for uh, COVID, and this is the truck drivers. This has created a lot of tension, congestion sometimes. And the border officials, something that we have undermined, they have such an important role because they have really assured delivery of essential services. They have been under a, a specific stress. So we have created um, a guidance. There was a global guidance on psychosocial skills for also border officials. This is a new angle that I found extremely in, important and uh, we should say is a gift from uh, COVID. And next week is, uh, is the World Week of Mental Health. I take the opportunity. This Saturday. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I encourage the audience to use the Q&A chat box for any questions that you might have for uh, specific panelists. But at this moment in time, I'd actually just like to open it up to the panel and to, to see if you have questions for one another or reactions or responses to the, anything that somebody on the panel said, um, disagreements as well. 
I just wanted to highlight the theme of support for the workforce uh, because I thought that that uh, example of border officials was very uh, innovative and interesting, but also stretches to all of the uh, comments made about the teacher workforce, the ECD workforce, um, all of these. Um, our, what we're hearing from the frontline providers is enormous levels of stress, even for things, and of course, you know, we can relate to this because of Zoom, but for, for example, phone call based workers who are dealing now with, you know, um, uh, very high levels of stress uh, on the calls, getting, you know, kind of uh, mixed levels of training for things like telecounseling kinds of skills um, and uh, having uh, now, as with various degrees of uh, reopening up all the scheduling kinds of things, um, but uh, these are highly stressed workforces um, uh, in this situation. Yeah, and, and maybe piggybacking on that, actually, I was thinking about, um, I'm talking about teachers a bit uh, in my comments today, but there's momentum around the psychosocial support that teachers need that's been further illuminated because of the pandemic. And I'd be curious to hear from all of the panelists, um, but thinking Hero from the ECD perspective and Lena from the mental health and psychosocial perspective, what opportunities do you see from your vantage point about how we can better support teachers working in this, these spaces for their own psychosocial well-being so that they, they can then take care of the kids that are in their charge? And of course, there are health considerations that intersect with that as well, Michaela. So yeah, I just, I'd love to hear if there are suggestions or thoughts about um, strategic opportunities or entry points to support teachers. Um, well, Mary, you have been doing some uh, uh, groundbreaking work on that. Uh, uh, ongoing support of teachers, right, and creating a community, because uh, we talk a lot, of course, about the importance of self-care, right, and monitoring that, asking people uh, about their own needs instead of us figuring out. And, um, that's one of the things I know you do. Um, but also uh, self-care means also community building. Um, and and, and uh, I know about your program, uh, you have some wonderful ways to do that uh, using, you know, uh, online and, and uh, it's uh, uh, E and M platforms like mobile platforms to do that. That's very, very important, especially during COVID, but uh, also during other, uh, you know, uh, emergencies. Um, so these are some initial thoughts. Uh, it cannot be an afterthought. It has to be something ongoing. Um, um, you know, and, and also at the same time attempts to reduce stigma because many times, you know, uh, people have a lot of trouble reporting their own struggles uh, with distress. So that uh, needs to be an ongoing, um, you know, effort. We also should not forget that although people struggle, the majority of people, uh, you know, will end up somehow adapting to the new circumstances, what we call resilience. And it's always remarkable to see, despite of this tremendous struggle, when things settle down, um, a lot of people will end up, you know, adjusting to these. Um, actually, I was wondering, how do you think the teachers, uh, how are they doing now? And how do you think will end up doing after this uh, ends? Mary. Yeah, thanks, Lena. That's a, it's a good question. And I, and I think you're right, right? The, we talk about resilience in, in, our, uh, in our multiple sectors and humanitarian response. And it is incredible uh, what people adapt to and, and what they um, accommodate in this. And so we know that there's a lot of, uh, yeah, the human potential to do so is, is incredible, but it doesn't, I guess my concern is that doesn't mean they still don't need support and it still shouldn't be a major priority for, for our work. Um, and teachers in particular, I think again and again, whether it's a crisis context or not, uh, continue to take on the lion's share of, of work um, and wear these multiple hats and, and sometimes are expected 
expected to do things that are really beyond the scope of their work. And they may not um, actually be the best place to provide that support, but they step into the fray because there's no alternative. And I think there's some real risks in that. And so on the one hand, I think, yeah, you're, you're absolutely right, Lena, the teachers will continue to just kind of take it on. Um, but certainly we're hearing because of the health pandemic, um, the, the stress levels are, yeah, as, as Hero was talking about, are just through the roof and um, really, I think, demanding more attention and hopefully we'll get more attention. But again, I think there's just a real fear that they just keep doing what they're doing and we continue to um, respect their resilience and celebrate their resilience without making significant systemic changes. So it's just, yeah, it's a concern I have. Okay, we're going to open it up to the audience now and going to collect a couple of questions. So one question that has come in is around uh, thinking about systems again and thinking about how, is it that, how do we work with, with national governments, um, knowing that migrants and refugees are oftentimes excluded from, from national systems in each of the, the sectors that you represent, uh, but also thinking about work with non-state actors and what is the role of non-state actors, so even civil society, for instance, in the delivery of services and what are some of the barriers that have come in the way in working with working with and through governments. Nikela, do you want do you want to start us yes, off? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, that's a good, good question. Actually, from the experience of also the COVID in this region, I think uh, the also the role of the regional economic commission, like the EGA, the East African uh, community, has played a very important role. Uh, and when we are talking about cross-border dialogue, dialogue and issue. For instance, we had here the, the, the alarming figures of the truck drivers, uh, an increasing trend of COVID. So this is a typical cross-border threat. And this is, uh, was also managed through the collaboration of bilateral and cross-border meetings. It's still, uh, it's still a challenge, it has not solved, but what I've seen is that sometimes the role of the Regional Economic Commission is important also to influence uh, a country policy when uh, we are dealing on a uh, cross-border issue. Because when we are facing pandemic, we should remember that it's not only country-based response. And if we don't engage in bilateral and cross-border dialogue, we may fail to be comprehensive in the response. And the, in terms of the role of non-state actor, of course, we all recognize the importance and the, the excellent work that many NGOs and civil society they are doing on the field. As a UN agency, we work closely with them and uh, I encourage uh, that this collaboration should be strengthening, strengthening the team. And also can be a mutual exchange. So there is no doubt that engagement of the civil society and not the actor is, uh, is relevant. Okay, thank you. Um, Hiro, so this question is for you um, of how do we sort of better coordinate these intersectoral approaches since you represent ECD that has long standing experience of, of inter and multi sectoral work? Uh, how do we strengthen these approaches? And also, since you're engaged in, in action oriented research, how is your own sort of research work pivoted at this moment when sort of the field feels even more distant and harder to reach? Uh, sure, yeah, and I can, um, maybe I'll start with the last question, but uh, yeah, we certainly are now, uh, we're embarking on an evaluation, uh, uh, this week, next week, uh, on an evaluation of a phone-based model um, uh, in Jordan, um, and are uh, informing uh, more broadly beyond impact evaluation, the m and &E approaches. Um, there are some new questions um, arising about how do we uh, assess quality? Um, when it comes, for example, to phone-based services. And so we're developing quality measures and collaboration mm -hmm. with a variety of NGOs. And again, this is across Bangladesh, mm -hmm. India, and the Middle East. Um, the, uh, just turning back to the civil society organization, I think in the ECD world, the regional networks play an enormous role um, and they are increasingly kind of growing and uh, responding to the issues right now around uh, COVID and migration. Um, 
these are the Arab Network on Early Childhood Development, the African uh, uh, Early Childhood Network, uh, the Asia Regional uh, Network, ARNEC, uh, wow. ISA um, for uh, uh, Eastern and Central Europe. So, um, and there are lots of networks in Latin America. So I think um, civil society has a very important role um, to play in disseminating information and the kinds of innovations that uh, uh, NGOs and other actors um, as well as government are, are doing. Um, uh, the challenges of coordination, I think, are, um, have been enormous in part because uh, 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 suddenly in many places, the delivery platforms were reduced to certain really emergency response around COVID. And that meant that certainly health sector uh, remained primary while a lot of other sectors of services shut down um, in the kind of lockdown phases. And so the challenge was can, can that, the, yeah, so, um, so talk about task shifting when the CHVs are uh, uh, community health workers um, have a huge new task on their hands. How could they possibly be expected to then engage in some of these additional things, like in my field in early childhood, um, kind of nurturing care um, kinds of interventions, right? Responsive uh, care, um, when everything else is being put on their plate in, in, in hugely challenging ways. So, so that has been really challenging. Um, and as uh, areas emerge um, in varying ways from a kind of lockdown situation, I think um, the question is, can, can uh, a new kind of coordination and the challenges of what we now call hybrid programs, right? Um, and geographic variation and what happens depending on what the reopening uh, conditions are, those are some of the, the, the next challenges around coordination. Thank you. Um, Can so I add we, something? Uh, for, uh, just inspire me on the, the quality when um, Dr. Hero was talking about how we can assure the quality referring to the non-state actor or NGO, etc. But I think monitoring and quality control is, uh, is one of the challenges also in the humanitarian sector anyway. And uh, especially during COVID, I have some exchange with university here, how we can really expand this new methodology because COVID is something that supports us remotely to continue services because when you are in humanitarian, it's life saving, you cannot stop. But uh, how are you going to monitor? And this is extremely complex. So the partnership with the university and the humanitarian agency, I think here is very, very critical because we are in front of identify new approach that can be a, a mode to also improve what we were doing before. So maybe also through this panel, maybe we can set a new collaboration focusing on what's on this specific task. We have some colleagues in the field uh, mentioned in South Sudan uh, and uh, they're also in Somalia. They are experimenting and try to evaluate an innovative approach. For instance, there was one proposal in South Sudan also to use the drone for delivery and monitoring for vaccine or supplies of medicines. So th there is new, mm, lots of technology also that we should look at together and uh, we need the partnership with the universities. Great, thank you. I, I love this idea of this uh, forum as a starting point for, for collaboration among uh, all of us in the work that we are doing. Uh, so great forward insight, uh, Michaela. Um, I'm going to ask Mary the last question that our audience has posed, um, which is in thinking about uh, the sustainability of, of service delivery, uh, particularly as we're seeing um, school closures and then reopenings and then schools closing down again, both in setting in humanitarian settings as well as here in the, the United States as well. Uh, and I make this link because sometimes we think of these settings as, as far and out there, but there's resonance in what is happening right here uh, and now where we are situated in, in New York City. Um, how do you think about issues of sustainability, quality, uh, financing of, of remote service delivery, knowing that we are falling short in, in terms of delivering the services for, for children, uh, particularly? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And, and happy to have uh, my colleagues also chime in if they'd like to, to share. 
I think it's something we have to look at really carefully. And, and as you said, it's not limited to, you know, crisis environments as something happening in, in many countries because of this basically global education crisis that everybody's been thrown in. Um, and so, you know, issues of gas sustainability, quality, and, and what we're hoping to return to or not return to, right? I think those are some of the questions that everyone's um, pondering. Um, so I think, you know, that's part of the, I guess, the learning process that we're going to have to continue to engage in, the research and the formal processes, but also the informal processes. And I think certainly um, a common thread through the conversation today, again, has been the inclusion of the people who are directly affected or directly implementing these services or, you know, doing the teaching or what, what might be. And so how can we find ways to uh, make sure that their, their representation is real and authentic in these conversations and in the learning process? How is that filtered, you know, back into um, the decision making at the, you know, at the school level, at the community level, at the service level, at the, at the policy level? And, um, you know, it's tricky when I think about quality and the delivery of education through remote or hybrid approaches and, and where we feel that we're falling short. Um, yeah, I know there's a lot of tension because uh, on the kind of private sector, tech sector side, people are thinking, oh, these are new opportunities to leverage technology, um, to reach students and, and even, you know, to replace teachers and, um, you know, to create these educational opportunities. That is very scary to me. Um, and I think we have to find ways to hold all of us accountable for these conversations. And, and yes, the opportunities that are presented and certainly leveraging technology. Technology is a wonderful resource, but I don't think it's going to solve all of our problems and we need to really hold that intention with conversations we're having about um, service delivery and especially education delivery. Um, and I think, yeah, the sustainability of it, I, I, yeah, to be determined, Vador, I don't know if I have a good, a good answer to that question. I think we'll certainly see, um, I mean, even at the higher education level, I hear faculty saying, well, we're going to continue teaching classes online, even if we've never done it before. And that's okay. We, there's, there's scope for that. Um, but I think to have kind of a healthy discussion about when that's, you know, most applicable and when it's not, um, we need to con continue to wrestle with it. Um, yeah, so I don't have I don't have an elegant answer for you. I think it's really messy. I think we're still learning. I think we need to create opportunities for the key people doing this work to be feeding into these decisions. Um, and hopefully we're really holding them, you know, placing the value on them that they deserve in the process. Yeah. And if Thank I you. may add one sentence to connect the well-being resources for displaced uh, persons to those for the host population through national strategies and intersectoral collaboration. Yes, exactly. Wonderful. So, yeah, is there if I can add seconds? in terms of a platform, global platform, I want just to remind that the global compact of refugees and the global compact of migration, which are the first global framework, uh, try to help countries to assist in managing forward migration and auto migration. And both of them, uh, they have a component for education and for health and uh, mental health, etc. We are in the phase now that the countries, they are implementing so there is uh, the time and the momentum to advocate uh, for a proper implementation on those global commitment. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much um, for all your comments and for your poignant remarks and, and reminding us about the need to really sort of center communities, different com communities, host communities, displaced communities in the work that we carry forward. Uh, and that these are in, in fact real sticky dilemmas. There are no clear Got answers and solutions that uh, that can be belted out, uh, but continued considerations for for quality, for sustainability. Uh, this idea of expedited localization, Mary, that you um, suggested, and then in thinking really about different levels and layers of of integration and coordination in the work that we do to be able to to serve uh, and uphold children's rights and and ensure that we can create enabling environments that allow them to to thrive and flourish. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Committee on Forced Migration, uh, I'd like to thank all of our uh, panelists. And uh, from our panelists and me, I'd like to thank our audience for joining us today. And we wish you the best and hope you stay well and safe and healthy. And please don't forget to join us for our next conversation, which will be two weeks from now on October 22nd 
at 10 a.m. U.S. EST on climate, conflict, and coronavirus. Uh, thank you very much and be well.